Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am so happy you are all here this morning. Like was said earlier, you braved the, the weather. At least it was pretty rough earlier. I'd like to begin by thanking you all as a congregation for allowing me this opportunity and to our Pastor Bryant and to all the elders for, for allowing me to bring what is normally in our morning Bible study hour, uh, our, our, our trip through the book of Hebrews. This morning we will be dealing with, with some, some heavy subjects. It is an admonition, as Tom mentioned. And I don't bring this, men- this, this message this morning for any reason other than that's what's next in the text. That's the benefit of verse-by-verse teaching, is I don't decide what I bring to you. The text does. I do have to question, however, Pastor Jim and the elders' decision in letting me do this. Uh, it's one thing to allow the, the young, inexperienced servant to serve you lunch on a Tuesday afternoon. It's a whole other thing to put him in charge of a banquet feast. But nonetheless, here I am. Hebrews is a marvelous book. It is a book of precious promises in Jesus Christ, wonderful truths. It is an awesome and beautiful message about Jesus Christ but it is also a book of warnings, very serious warnings about very real dangers and the terrible consequences if those warnings are not heeded. So it is a book of promises and a book of perils. It is a book of admonitions yet assurances. Hebrews tells us that God spoke long ago in many portions and in many ways, and now he has spoken in his son. These two Revelations are not in contradiction to each other. They're one unified message. What was spoken in the Old Testament is the promise, of, and it is revealed in Jesus Christ. So Hebrews is God speaking. It is God speaking about his son, and it is God speaking to you and to me. It is telling us who is Jesus Christ, that he is God incarnate. Why he came? He came to restore what was lost. He came to redeem sinners. He came to render powerless Satan and death. And he came to relate to us, to to mankind, as the one who brings us to God, gives us access to him, and ever lives to intercede for us. Now, God is not only speaking in Hebrews. The whole of the Bible, of course, is speaking. It is his revelation to us. So when we come to Scripture, we're coming to hear God speak, yes? When when we gather together like we are here to hear the preacher preach from the Word of God, we're coming to hear God speak. When you open your Bibles up at home, you're coming to hear God speak. You are all here today presumably because you are interested in hearing what God has to say. You, like millions of others this very hour all across the land, are gathered together to hear God's words being spoken to them. Some get crumbs, some get a full feast. But the question I pose is, are you listening? Are you listening to what God is saying? I was trying to hash out earlier in the week uh, what's more important to listen or to hear? And so I, I went to my, my wonderful wife, and I was going to pose a, a question. And then I was going to reverse listening and hearing and see which one sounded better. So I said, honey, would you say that your husband hears what you're saying but doesn't listen? Or yes, was the answer I got. <laughs> so uh, that pretty much summed it up. I got more of an answer than I expected. But uh, I've heard it said the other way around as well, like perhaps a teacher would say, you know, I've got a classroom full of of students who listen to me all day long, but they never really hear me, right? Are you hearing me? You know, that kind of expression. We've all heard that. But to to, to clarify it in the English language, why I'm focusing on listening is uh, uh, to listen is the act of perceiving sound in the ear, where, uh, or that's hearing. To listen is the process of actually it's, it's, it's the act of the will to understand and process that, what you are hearing. So I posed the question this morning is, are we listening? Are you listening? It is true that God is still speaking this morning. He is speaking in the world. He is speaking right here in his word. 
when God speaks, we should certainly listen, right? I mean, it is God after all. Many of you will remember many years ago, there was a television commercial for a, a brokerage house or a financial firm or something called E.F. Hutton. And the tagline was, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. Why? Because he talked about what interests them, which was money. Apparently, he was an expert of some sort. People listen to what interests them, what drives them. And I guess what I'm getting at is I'm hoping that you're all here together this morning with the intent not just to hear God's word, but to actually listen to him. So what is God saying to us this morning in his word? Well, it boils down to this. The author of Hebrews, through the Holy Spirit, is reminding us of Israel's failure to listen and obey the voice of God. This reminder serves as the illustration for a very serious warning of not listening to him. Because those who do not listen and respond in obedience to God's word suffer the tragic loss of what God so mercifully and freely offers today. The author of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 25 says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. He's not talking about himself, nor is he talking about the one who delivered the message. He's talking about God who is speaking. So I implore you this morning not to listen to me, but to listen to what God is saying through his word. If you bow with me as we ask the Lord to bless our time. Oh God, you are a merciful and gracious God. We thank you for your word, for the time that you've given us to be in your word, to, to study your truths. We ask you, Father, this morning that through your spirit, you would use your word to cut through hard hearts, that you would open deaf ears, that you would help us to all see the majesties and the glories of Jesus Christ. Write these truths on our heart, Father. May what we do here this morning glorify your Son, and therefore glorify you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The author of Hebrews has a message for his audience. Beginning in verse 7, chapter 3. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says. Now, this is a wonderful affirmation of the divine inspiration of Scripture. Because what he begins to do here in chapter, I'm sorry, verse 7 through 11 is quote Psalm 95. And who wrote Psalm 95? Well, in chapter 4, verse 7, we, we, the, the author of Hebrews attributes the human authorship to David. But here he attributes it to the Holy Spirit. You see, David wrote of the Israelites' experience in the wandering. That's what this text is about. And he got it from Moses, who wrote it down in, in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And, of course, Moses experienced it. And so it goes from Moses, it goes to David, and then it goes from David to the author of Hebrews, and now it goes from the author of Hebrews to us today. God uses all these messengers or representatives to deliver his word because the source behind them all is the Holy Spirit. We know this from 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is inspired by God, or literally, God breathed. Peter says that men were moved by the Holy Spirit to write what God spoke. In other words, when the Bible is spoken, it is God speaking. This gives great weight and emphasis to this message. It isn't just David of old who said this. It's not some old religious book. More than 40 times in the book of Hebrews, the author quotes the Old Testament, and he attributes it to either God says, the Son says, or the Holy Spirit says. This is God speaking this morning in his word. And notice what tense the verb is. The Holy Spirit says. Well, this is the present tense. God not only spoke in the past. He not only spoke in his Son. He not only spoke in the original letters that became our, our text, our, our, our Bible. But he is speaking today. 
hear his voice today. Spurgeon points out that whenever the Holy Spirit exhorts us in his word, he does so in the present tense. He writes, he bids us now to repent or now to believe or now to seek the Lord. Hear his voice today. Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. There is urgency in this today, not tomorrow, not later in life, but listen to what God is saying today. It was October 8th, a Sunday night, many years ago, and a preacher was teaching to a very large congregation. His text was Matthew 27, and his subject was, what will you do with Christ? Meaning, will you accept him as your savior? At the conclusion of his sermon, he said this, I wish you would take this text home with you. Turn it over in your minds during the week. And next Sunday, we will come to Calvary and the cross, and we will decide what to do with Jesus of Nazareth. With that, the worship leader rose up and led the congregation in a hymn. And they sang, Today the Savior calls for refuge flies. The storm of justice falls and death is nigh. But they never finished the hymn. Because as they continued to sing, off in the distance, the sound of sirens arose. And they grew louder and louder until they could no longer be ignored. And the congregation broke up and rushed out into the cool Chicago night to see what all the commotion was about. See, that preacher was D.L. Moody. That October 8th was in the year 1871, and that Sunday night was the night the Great Chicago Fire broke out. It burned for three days. It destroyed thousands and thousands of homes and buildings, killed hundreds. Moody swore after that that he would never tell people to think about it for a while and come back next week. There is urgency in what God is saying today. You are not promised tomorrow. None of us are. So if you are hearing God speak to your heart today, what is he saying? He says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So what is a hard heart? What does he mean by that? Well, he uses here from verse 7 to 11, this text from the Old Testament, the Jewish people's own history as the perfect example or illustration for the hardened heart. So we will understand what the hardened heart is by looking at this example. And what this is in verse 7 through 11 is Psalm 95, which happens to also be verse 7 through 11. And the focus here is, is the Israelites' experience in the wilderness. From the exodus to the wildering wanderings, their disobedience and disbelief, to their failure to enter God's promised land his promised rest. This is what the author of Hebrews is relating to these first century Hebrew Christians. And he does it again through Psalm 95. And there's an interesting thing about Psalm 95. I asked myself, why did he go to Psalm 95? Why didn't he go to Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy where the accounts of these are? Or why not go to another Psalm? Psalm 78 gives much more detail about this experience. Why Psalm 95? Well, we're going to spend a little time in Psalm 95. If you could turn there with me. And let's see what Psalm 95 is all about. Now, if you come from a Roman Catholic background or perhaps a Lutheran or Anglican background, you might recognize Psalm 95 as what is called the Venite from the Latin, which means, O come, right? You remember the Christmas hymn, O come all ye faithful, venite auto remus, we sing. That's the Latin for O come, the beginning words of this psalm. It is a call to worship. Verses 1 through 7, the first half of verse 7, are a call to worship. From the last half of 7 through 11, it is a call to obedience. A call to worship and a call to obedience. Follow along in verse 1. O come. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. 
David is calling his people to express love and thanksgiving through joyful singing and praise to God. And this isn't a forced cheerfulness. Have you ever tried to, to force your children to be thankful or cheerful? It doesn't work, does it? It actually usually embitters the opposite. No, this is a call from David to express what is already in their heart, thanksgiving and exuberant joy. Why? Because, because our Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. You see, the heart that knows God, who he is, what he's done, the heart that considers God, is a joyful heart. It's a heart full of thanksgiving. In verses 4 and 5, we read, In whose hands are the depths of the earth? The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Now, this reminded me of Isaiah 40. And you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read a couple verses from Isaiah 40. This great declaration of the greatness of God. Isaiah says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens by the span, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighed the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or his counselor, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding? He goes on and on. He says, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare him to? Oh, how great a God we have. Oh, how great of God. And he closes Isaiah 40 with this. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the heavens, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. What a great God we have. Those who wait for the Lord. That word for wait could also be translated hope in, those who hope in the Lord. It finds its primary root in a word that means to bind together. To bind all of yourself with God, those who wait on him, those who hope in him, those who cling to him. They will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and never grow weary. That is a picture of perseverance. That is what our author in Hebrews is talking about, perseverance. The heart that knows God is the heart that clings to God. This is the heart that Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians 5 when he says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And the heart that knows God, that clings to him, that considers him always is the heart that humbles itself before him. Look back in Psalm 95. You should still be there. I'm not. In verse 6, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And stop right there. This is the heart that recognizes the holiness of God, his glory, his worthship. That's where we get the word worship, an old English word, worthship, to acclaim to God his, his worth. This heart is humble before God. It is a, an obedient heart. And it brings us to the second theme of Psalm 95, a major theme of our text in Hebrews, which is obedience to God's word. So the call to worship has the call to obedience attached to it. 
listening to him because true worship of God comes through obedience to his word. That is why these two themes are united in Psalm 95, and that is why our author of Hebrews uses Psalm 95, because what were they doing? The author of Hebrews was, trying, was attempting to prove to his audience, that first century Hebrew Christian church, the, the unique supremacy of Jesus Christ over all of the Old Testament. And if Jesus is so uniquely supreme, it follows that they should give him complete trust and obedience. They were being tempted to turn away from him, and perhaps some of them had, to not listen to what God had said, to what he had said in his son, to go back to the old way. In Psalm 95, the second half of verse 7, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they had seen my work. The psalmist is recalling again Israel's disobedience at these two places in the wilderness, Meribah and Massa. Meribah, our author of Hebrews, quotes the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, and he says, when they provoked me, literally meaning rebellion or revolt against God. Massa, he also uses the Septuagint, and, and he translates that as day of trial, a common New Testament word for tempting or testing. And these two events, recorded in Exodus 17 and Numbers 20, this, this is where Israel in the wilderness was grumbling. They were complaining over the situation of the water, really. It either tasted bad, it was bitter, or there wasn't any. And it revealed that their hearts were hardened towards God. It, it was manifested in their unthankfulness. It was manifested in their bitterness, their rebellion, their grumbling. It manifested itself in their disbelief of God. And this is really the issue at hand here this morning, is disbelief. It was for them, whom David wrote to, it was for the author of Hebrews, and perhaps even for some here today. You see, the people that God saved out of Egypt, he saved them by an undeniable display of his power. Ten plagues, parting of the Red Sea. He led them by an undeniable display of his presence, pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. He shook the mountain and shone his glory up on the mountain, and it radiated from Moses. He cared for them by an undeniable display of his provision. He gave them his law. He gave them food, manna, quail. He gave them water. There was no denying God's power. There was no denying God's faithfulness. There was no denying God's word. But they hardened their hearts. They refused to give God their trust, to be obedient to him. What the scripture testifies to us this morning, beloved, is that a hard heart is a heart of disbelief. It is a heart that does not trust God. It is a heart that is engaged in conflict with him. It provokes him. It continually tests him. No matter how many miracles God performs, no matter how clearly he reveals himself to them, no matter how faithful he was, they would not listen. They hardened their hearts. Did you know that there is a type of hearing loss called sensorineural hearing loss? In fact, if you have hearing loss, you probably have this type. And because of the damage of the inner ear, the beginning stages of this hearing loss, you can still hear sound, but you can't understand speech. This can happen in a spiritual sense as well. Maybe you grew up in a Christian home. You heard the things of God spoken over and over again for many years. You've been to church every Sunday, even to this day. Perhaps you taught Bible study, children's chapel, home Bible study. Over and over again, year after year after year, you've heard God speaking, but has had no effect. It's just become the same old rigmarole. 
and you say things in private like, I don't read the Word of God anymore. It's too hard to understand. Or, I don't believe that part of the Bible because the Bible says all sorts of things. Or, yeah, yeah, I've heard that stuff about Jesus enough. These are things that I personally have heard people say to me, people that profess to be Christians, people that I love. It is possible to hear God speaking but not listen. And how does this happen? Well, back in our text, in verse 8, it says they provoked God. In verse 9, it says they tested him. In verse 10, it says they always go astray in their hearts. And they did not know my ways. Hebrews chapter 3, Psalm 95, is saying to us that the sin that the Israelites commit that hardens the heart is the sin of not trusting God. And this came about through their constant disobedience. They always went astray. Through their refusal to listen to God, to turn from their sin, to trust in Him, they did not know my way. The Hebrew word for know in Psalm 95 is a common word in the Old Testament. And it suggests a level of intimacy. Adam knew his wife Eve, and, they, and she bore a son. So on and so forth. There are several accounts like that. It can mean perceive, be concerned about. It can mean to understand, to know personally, intimately, and thoroughly. It's how you're supposed to know your spouse. Men, how are you supposed to grow intimate with your wife? And I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about a real deep, intimate relationship. Well, you've got to spend time with her. You have to consider her. And you have to listen. There are far too many of us who are hearing impaired. There are even more who are listening impaired. The Israelites did not know God. They knew of him. There was no denying him. But they were not intimate with him because they would not listen to him. Therefore, they did not have hearts for him. They had hardened them through disbelief and disobedience. This is the example that the author of Hebrews brings before us today. Today, if you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice, if you hear his voice, they heard God's voice. They heard him speaking in his miracles, in his power. They heard him speaking in his presence, in his glory. They heard him speaking in his love and provision for them, but they would not listen. Therefore, they possessed, as the author of Hebrews says, Evil, unbelieving hearts, hard hearts, deceived hearts, hearts of sin and disobedience. And what is the consequence of this? Well, in verse 10 it says, Therefore I was angry with this generation. That's God speaking. I was angry with them. This is not how God feels about those who are in his house. This is how God feels about those that reject him, that do not listen to him. Psalm 95 says this, God loathed them. He loathed them. This is a not slight perturbance. This is not grieved by the Holy Spirit because of their backsliding. This is hatred. That's not something we like to hear. That's not something that's often preached. But I want you to see it for yourself, so turn with me to Psalm 5. Beginning in verse 4, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate 
all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. There's no getting around that. But there is hope. Look at the contrast in verse 7. But as for me, this is David. Look back at the beginning of Psalm 5. You'll see in the, in the inscription, a psalm of David. Was David a backslider? Yes. Was David a perfect man? No. Was he hated? No. But as for me, he says, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house your holy temple, I will bow in reverence to you. That is a humble heart, perfect no, but a heart that loves God, a heart that knows him. Turn over a couple pages to Psalm 11. In verse 5, the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked, he will rain snares, Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. This morning on the way to church, we saw what many refer to as the power of God, the wrath of God. It was a mighty storm behind us. On the road behind us, the, the, the morning sky lit up with a brilliant blue fire. I think it was a, a, a transformer that exploded. And moments after that, the power lines we were about to drive under exploded in a shower of sparks. It was quite frightening. There was lightning everywhere. Some of it lasted for several seconds, it seemed. That's nothing compared to the wrath of God. It'd be like throwing a marshmallow at somebody. That's nothing. But verse 7, again, there is always hope, for the Lord is righteous, and he loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face, it says. Who are the upright? Those that trust in God, those that trust his word, those that trust his son. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God. Who are the children of God? Those are those in the house. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. The upright will behold the face of God. And the last psalm we'll look at is Psalm 45, and this is a big one. In verse 6 of Psalm 45. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of unrighteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. Does that sound familiar? Well, if you've been with us in Hebrews, you know that our author quotes this in chapter 1, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 10, he says, Listen, O daughter, give attention and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house. Then the king will desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Bow down to him. This is the humble heart of Psalm 95 that is obedient in worship. Verse 15, they will be led forth with gladness and rejoicing. They will enter into the king's palace. Simple question, what is the king's palace? That is his house. In the place of your fathers will be your sons. You shall make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the people will give you thanks forever and ever. These are, in the, these are the ones in the household of God. These are the ones that have clung to him, that have believed to him. Hebrews is showing us that Jesus Christ is the one who we are to put our, our trust in. He is the one we are to cling to. He is the one that we are to consider that we put our faith in because he is God's revealed word to us. Turn back to our text in Hebrews. This is not what the Israelites in the wilderness did. They rebelled against God continually. They continually tested him. 
They went astray in their hearts. They did not listen. Verse 12, they are evaluated by God in this way. He says, take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. God evaluated them. God, in the beginning of chapter 3, he evaluates Moses as faithful. He evaluates Christ as even more faithful. Here he's evaluating these Israelites as having unbelieving hearts, evil unbelieving hearts that fall away from the living God. Their hearts were deceived by sin, he says in verse 13. In, in verse 18 and 19, they were disobedient because of unbelief. And because of this, God swore in his wrath, verse 11, that they would not enter his rest. Jude 5 sums it up like this. The Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. Is this God going back on his word? I thought the, the promised land was promised. How can it not be fulfilled? I thought God didn't lie. In Deuteronomy 28, and you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to be here briefly. Before Moses dies, before the last of the wilderness generation dies and they enter into the promised land, God reiterates his covenant with them. He says in verse 1, Now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All the blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. And then he lists the blessings. Verse 3, blessed shall you be. Verse 4, blessed shall you be. Verse 5, blessed. Verse 7, uh, verse 6, blessed. Verse 7, more and more and more. And then we come to verse 15. But... It shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I, with which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And again, cursed, 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 over and over again. You shall bring out as much seed to the field, but you will gather in little, for the locust will consume it. Nothing will work. Verse 45, so all these curses shall come on you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. You see, God's covenant with them of the promised land came with the flip side. If you don't obey, I promise you destruction. Judgment. In chapter 30, in verse 19 of Deuteronomy, he says this, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and your length of days. God promised great blessings to them if they would love God, obey him, and cling to him. And he promises that to us as well through his son, Jesus Christ. God didn't go back on his word. He was faithful to his word. So what do we do about this? What is the answer to this danger of the hardening of the heart? Well, for the corporate house of God, for the church, he says, take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an unbelie evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. We take care. Literally, see to it. We recognize in each other the tendencies to drift. We recognize in each other the tendencies of a hardened heart. We come alongside. That's what... Verse 13 says, but encourage one another. Come alongside and encourage. We don't just let them go. We pray for them. We exhort them from God's word. 
and we love them. But for the hardened, for those who listen to the word of God over and over again, and it's just the same old rigmarole, the prescription provided by God begins in verse 1 of chapter 3. Consider Jesus. That is the gospel call, is to think deeply on Christ, on who he is, who the Holy Spirit says he is. In chapter 1, he says he is the heir and the sustainer of all. He is the creator. He is the redeemer of sinners. He is the word of God living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and he can cut through a hard heart. He can enliven the dead heart. But you must consider him. You must look to him. You must cling to him. And you must obey. It is, a very, it is, it is very possible to be in the house of God, but not be a member of the house of God. To be here every Sunday, hearing God's word spoken to you over and over and over, and to even make a good show of it. Perhaps you teach, you serve, you witness to others, but you've never fully put your trust in Christ. You profess to be a Christian, but you don't confess him. What's the difference? To profess is to put something forward. To confess is to stand with. You stand with God in what he has said about his son, that he is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. You stand with what God says about you, that you are a sinner in need of a savior. No amount of work of your own can do it. You stand with Christ meaning that you have faith in him and him alone in the work that he did on the cross. Today still stands. God's offer of rest still stands today. It is not the promised rest of Canaan, but that was a picture. That was to be a picture to us of the, of the rest that he offers today, an eternal rest of salvation in Christ, an exodus from your sin and, and the bondage in that sin to a life eternal, full of riches and blessings in heaven, peace with God, eternal life. If you hear and you listen, you will hold fast your confidence. You will hold fast your boast in Christ, your hope in him. Because this is what the people in the house of God do. They hold fast. What a blessed assurance that is to us. They persevere, but it begins with listening. I'd like to close with Romans, Romans chapter 10. I was going to read much of this chapter, but I think we'll condense it here. Verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And then in verse 16, he says this, However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah, he says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of Christ. I'm grateful you have been here this morning to bear with this word of exhortation, as the author of Hebrews says. And I implore you to put your trust in God's word. In his son, Jesus Christ. And join us in the house. 
crying out with Isaiah, I will wait on the Lord. I will cling to him. Where else am I going to go? For in him and him alone is salvation. And he will lift me up on eagles' wings. I will walk and I will not grow tired. I will run and I will not become weary. I will finish the race. And although my flesh is like the grass and the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. And his word has declared me to be his brother forever in the house. And nothing can separate me from the love of God. Is that you? Oh, Lord, I pray. Bow with me. Father, thank you so much for your word. It is sometimes difficult to listen to and convicting, but we are grateful for that, Father, for it is by hearing the word of Christ that we are saved, that we are given new life, that our old lives of sin are cast away, and behold, the new has come. I pray, Father, this morning that your word will not return void, that you will use it mightily through your spirit, and that if there are any here this morning with a hard heart, that you will use the word of God to break through that hard heart, to enliven it, to help them to see their sin, to turn from it, and to trust in you, in your Son, in whom is eternal life. Amen.